All right, there we go. Well, welcome. How to take fear out of childbirth class from Krisha Crosley, also known as Serenity Life Doula. And I have a passion helping people out. <laughs> I'm so excited y'all are here tonight to learn how to take this fear and step up to the starting line of your birthing game day with confidence. Um, so very well done for being here and getting yourself educated because that is the first step is the more knowledge you have, the more powerful you're going to be, the more educated decisions you can have, and the more in control you're going to be about your birthing game day and really any other aspect of life. So um, childbirth in our society is fearful. We are constantly have fear instilled upon us having to do with having a baby. And it is a God-given natural phenomenon. We are created to birth babies. We are created to keep our species alive on this planet. It is just an amazing innate ability. And it's no longer look like that, unfortunately. So we are mammals and we're created to give live birth. We're also made to produce milk for our young, just like any other mammal on this planet. But yet we're the only mammal that has to have vaginal checks, that has to give medications regularly to have a baby, has to be micromanaged and things like that, right? But all these other mammals on the planet are birthing babies just fine. They surround themselves in a very safe, closed environment and they actually won't have their baby until they feel safe and vulnerable and then they'll go through the birthing process which is utterly amazing if they don't feel safe they ain't gonna have a baby until they do we have those same exact in instincts as well when we feel safe and we feel calm and relaxed and our oxytocin levels are high and we feel love we have babies right? But when we're scared and we're tight and we're tense and we're worried and we're anxious, babies don't come out of our bodies. It is the same instincts that any other mammal have. We have as mammal. We have that mammalian instinct as well. So from 1970, just to give you a few statistics, from 1970 to 2020, our cesarean rate has grown 500%. That is like astronomical amount. So it's about 5% back in the 70s and now it's around 33, 34%. Now that's within the United States. I'm not sure about other countries. I know there's other countries on this um, class as well. So that's that's a lot. And I personally had my first child a little over 24 years ago. And me and my husband, we we claim it right now that we were completely ignorant. We knew nothing we thought we did. But no, we didn't know anything. And we went through our first birthing experience. We had the same scare tactics used then that are used now, you know, almost 25 years later. Not much has changed even in the last 25 years on the routine language around childbirth. So one thing that we, we were scared with is big baby. Oh, your baby's going to be big. Well, I'm not sure your baby's going to fit through your pelvis. But we also have terminology like baby's too small. Baby's not going to survive in there. We got to get the baby out. Or we have things like your pelvis is narrow. There's no way a baby's going to fit through that. Or your vagina's too tight. Or you're not dilating. And you're 38, 39 weeks. Well, you shouldn't be. You're still pregnant. You're not in labor. We also have, well, your baby's not engaged, meaning the baby's not down into the pelvis. Okay, sometimes babies don't engage until you're in labor. Your body won't dilate and open up until you have strong uterine contractions. But this is just routine language to bring that fear and that anxiety up to get you to do with how the medical industry wants us to have babies and how they have conditioned us this is how you were supposed to have babies. So there's two philosophies. There's the medical side and there's the midwifery care side, right? So you have one side that likes to micromanage, likes to medicate, likes to manage and control the entire birthing process and every turn have something to do for it. And then we have on the other side where it's like, we're just going to fold our hands and we're going to wait patiently. And we're going to let the baby come on baby's own time. Physiological birth, right? We just let the process happen. So there's two different 
types and you as the birthing uh, couples, you all need to figure out which model of care do you want? Which model of care do you line up with? If you want a natural birth experience, you need to be over here with the physiological birth. Let's kind of wait on it and let birth happen as it's going to happen. If you want more medical attention and you know want help with your birth, then you should be over here on this side. So this is very key to getting the birth that you desire and remaining calm and confident about your birthing experience. We are all different. We're all gonna choose different things and that's how it should be, okay? I personally am more on the, the natural side, let things happen, you know, things are intended to be a certain way. And that's how as a birth doula and a natural birth trainer, I give confidence and guide people. So if you're interested in the natural type of way, um, letting your body do what it's created to do, surrender to the process, kind of just, you know, tune out everything else around you and just go with it. I'm your natural birth trainer. I can help you get there with my train for birth workshop, give you confidence for that day you step up to the starting line of your birthing game day. So the fear monger, the, you're past your estimated due date or you're approaching your estimated due date, or even I've seen this one where, um, Gestational diabetes is, it happens, right? But they're using that label as everyone who has gestational diabetes has to be induced. Well, that's not true, nor is it true that gest gestational diabetes equals cesarean, right? It's how are you doing in your lifestyle as pregnancy? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating well? Are you drinking well? Is your, you know, how, your nutrition in your body is on point? If you're doing all those things, you can go as long as you need to until your baby's ready to, to come and meet you, right? Because you're controlling that in your life. Now, if you have it and you're just eating whatever you want, you're, you're staying up all night long, or you're just not drinking enough water, then that could actually affect how your baby will grow within. And that could be an issue at in during labor. Um, so that's, two ways of looking at one particular problem. Like there's always different viewpoints of how you can view one thing. So make sure if you are presented with something that gets you a little worried or scared, see the other viewpoints around it as well, because there are different viewpoints, which means some of you may need to get a second opinion. I've had a lot of messages this week on thank you so much because I've taught uh, birth prep 101 with those 20 questions ask your health care provider last week and they're like you saved my birthing experience because my provider was not on board with me and I put my running shoes on and I ran to a second opinion you have that option if you or feel like you're doing this constantly get your running shoes on and go get a second opinion because who has to live with the, your birthing experience for the rest of your life you do you want to make it the best you can, and you want to be in control. When you're in control and you're making educated decisions, you're going to feel much more at peace about what is happening, okay? Um, so knowledge is power. One thing I recommend to help keep fear out is to educate yourself, which you're already doing with this step tonight. Get as much education as you can. And you want to take classes that align with what your viewpoint is, okay? It's going to calm the fear. It's going to give you more knowledge so you can make decisions and feel just better about it. Two, your birth team. Who are you going to have come around you and support you to get your birthing goals? You're going to have a goal. What is your birthing goal? Or maybe you have multiple. That's fine. Who's going to help you get that? Which people are going to support you to get that? That know 100% you can get that goal, okay? Not, I'm going to, I'll let you try, or we will see. No, 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 no. Yes, you can do it. You got this. What do you need me to help you with? We're going to go after it. Let's do this. That type of motivation, confidence that yes, you can, okay? So that's your provider who's going to help you deliver your baby. Um, it's a, going to be, Hire a doula. Hey, we're trained in how to teach you how to advocate for yourself. We know the birthing process. Um, we can help you 
be educated. We can help you advocate for what you want to do. That's what I do. And I also train my clients and a lot of other people for birth, obviously. Um, but they tell me what your birthing goal is. And I'm like, awesome. And then I come around and I'm like, I'm going to help you get that. Let's do it. Okay. And we do it. Then it's also the healthy habits that we establish in pregnancy. So that is walking. I mean, you should be minimally walking every single day, 30 minutes. That is bare minimum, okay? Everyone should be doing that. If you're in more of moderate exercise or you're doing HIIT training or yoga or Pilates or anything like that, then you just keep doing what you're doing. Um, our bodies like the movement, hydration, half your body weight in ounces every single day. Yeah, it gets boring to drink water every day. Spice it up, throw some electrolytes in there, throw some fruit in there. Get the hydration down. Your body functions way better if it's hydrated. Nutrient dense food, you need to be eating good, good meals to help support the pregnancy. You need positive people around you. If you've got someone in your space that's causing you fear, anxiety, worry, uh, you're scared all the time, you need to kick that person to the curb. I don't care who it is, right? You have got to be in a positive space with positive influence around you to get that positive birthing experience as well. And a big, big part of that is the team in that moment that you have to be vulnerable to meet your baby. Um, Chiropractic care is also highly recommended in pregnancy to help the well-being of you and your baby through pregnancy. And even a massage therapist will help. Massage therapists help with the soft tissues of the body, can also help with any types of aches, discomforts that you could be having with uh, pregnancy. But it also helps calm. It's relaxing. It raises the oxytocin levels. And you, oh, you just love everybody after you have a massage. That's how birth should be. Birth should be very loving, calming, and relaxing. It's like, it's, I see it so many times because I'm, I'm, I'm on the outside of the hospital and, you know, my families are birthing at home or birth centers. And it's just, it's such a lovable moment to watch uh, a couple become parents. And I do work a lot with first time parents because that's, I just, I just love you first time parents. All right, so um, one tip I'm gonna share with you that is actually the number one reason for quote unquote failure to progress, okay? So we hear this word failure to progress. It is a medical term in labor that is used and which will lead you into a cesarean, which will lead you actually into an unnecessary cesarean. So that means there was no medical reason why mom or baby needed to have a surgery, okay? Number one reason for failure to progress is lack of food and water during birth. Lack of food and water during birth. The one thing the hospital environments take away from you, maybe not all, but most. Okay, why? Because they're preparing you for surgery. Oh, you can't eat and drink because you might go this direction. When we're out of a hospital, we are like, eat, drink, eat, drink, eat, drink. Why? Because our bodies, our human bodies, need food and water every single day, whether we're pregnant or not. That's how we function. That's how we get energy. That's how we operate, food and water. I can't stress enough that you need food or water during labor or your body will stall. Like you have nothing to burn. Your contractions are gonna get more intense and the baby's gonna go nowhere because there's no fluids to help the baby come to the tissues of your body. And now you have no food to actually run the marathon. So eat and drink in labor. When you're at home, on your way to your birthing environment, take you a cooler of food and water so you have something to eat there and all you have to do is be honest and the last time you ate when they told you because guess what in a hospital setting they are skilled in emergencies that's what they're trained in that's what they do they can handle emergencies if there should be one period okay so take a look at your birthing situation what are your birthing goals is the team around you supportive in the desires that you want, right? Maybe do you need to change that environment or maybe that team around you? 
you're still pregnant, it's not too late. I want to encourage you that. Uh, there's people that switch all the time at 35, 36, 37 weeks. Yes, it's another type of stress load on top of you, but is it going to lead you into the birth you want? Is it going to lead you into that positive birthing experience that you're going to talk about for the rest of your life? How many birth experiences have you heard over the last few years? Everyone talks about their birthing experience. Somebody shares it, another one shares it, another one shares it, another one shares it. It's like a little, you know, domino effect on birthing experiences. We're going to hear some really fantastic ones, and we're going to hear a whole lot of ones that aren't so great. So I want to take that and flip it where we hear a whole bunch of awesome positive birthing experiences and some that aren't so great so then we know we're making a huge change in the birthing process it's innate it is within you surrender to the process i 100 percent believe you can birth your baby and i 100 percent believe your body will stretch just enough for the baby to exit okay so please get educated surround yourself with the people that will love on you and help you get there. And when you're ready, 34 plus weeks, you can come train with me and my train for birth workshop. And I'm happy to motivate you and give you even more confidence to step up to that starting line of your birthing game day. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Godwin now. Awesome, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Great. So I'm Dr. Kenyon Godwin of Active Family Wellness Center. I have been a chiropractor for 13 years now. I have helped and assisted and supported over a thousand pregnant women in my career. And I'm gonna get into some things with you uh, very briefly because I don't want, want to be respectful of your time and get time for questions. But one of the things that I like to share with you is when it comes to fear, when you think about fear and childbirth, and I know what some of you are thinking, and you're right, I've never had a baby, okay? <laughs> but that does not disqualify me from being in this role. I'm also a father of three daughters. I was there for every single birth throughout the whole process. So, but you, you are right. I can't tell you exactly what it feels like. So when it comes to fear of childbirth, there are four reasons that I commonly see that someone is afraid. The first one is, you know, uncertainty. They've never done it before. First time, they're not sure if it's going to hurt. You know, all kinds of things are going through their head. What if this doesn't work out? What if this happens? Second one is past experiences. Maybe they have had a child and they had a difficult birth. So now they're afraid for the, the next birth. The other one is, um, and these last two are actually the most common. The other one uh, is sharing of others' experiences. Kind of like what Krisha was just talking about. Sometimes you have that friend or family member, coworker. Nowadays, it doesn't have to be anybody you know. You just see a story on online, on social media, and you're like, oh my God, and it's the most horrific thing, right? So now you're afraid to have your own birthing experience. And then, of course, the last one may be your actual medical provider and medical staff, which Krisha also alluded to, whether it's, hey, your baby is big, or you have the station of diabetes, or you have this condition. And so all this fear is created about something that is natural. And so I say that it perpetuates one of the biggest lies in healthcare when it comes to pregnancy. Are y'all ready for what I believe is the biggest lie? Who's ready? Got to talk to me. All right. Well, I meant like in a chat. I meant in a chat, not like actual talk to me. <laughs> but I appreciate, I appreciate your effort. All right. So the biggest, the biggest lie that I, I see is that women who are, hold on, somebody's still talking. Please mute yourselves. I can deliver this part. You don't want to miss this. So the biggest lie is women who are fearfully and wonderfully made are somehow inadequate to be able to have a healthy delivery. So you mean to tell me that you can carry, incubate, and develop a human being that started off as two cells, which means they were microscopic, couldn't even see them, they now develop to 30 trillion cells with a personality and the ability to reproduce themselves one day. So you can do all of that, and yet you can't have a delivery, a natural birth without intervention. Am I the only one that thinks there's something wrong with that myth going on? So sometimes we just have to stop and slow down and think through these things. That is a miracle in itself. So you can perform a miracle in the process 
but you can't get the miracle out. I have yet to see any case study of a person who was pregnant and the baby just did not come out ever. It just stayed there forever. <laughs> now, if you've seen some, something like that, let me know. Not on National Geographic, not in the history book, not in medical literature. I've never seen a baby that's now 40 years old that's still living inside their mother. I like, just refused to come out, didn't come out, didn't work out. All right? I know. I'm a little different. Hopefully, uh, you were warned about me. So here's the thing. I've helped a lot of pregnant women, and I, I'm going to share with you really quickly the things that I have seen that have helped the ones that have been very successful, including my wife's experience with, you know, uh, our daughters. So here are the common things. The first one is education, which I applaud you. That's what you're doing tonight. You are learning. You're getting a different perspective. It's kind of how I look at school. School teaches you some basic things, but to be exceptional, you're going to have to go above and beyond on your own. That's even me as a doctor. School taught me how to be a safe, good chiropractor. But the Webster certification I have for pregnancy, I had to do that on my own. I had to do that outside of school. And most of the stuff that I use on a daily basis was not taught to me in school. I had to go above and beyond to reach this level. And so what you're doing tonight is you're deciding that I know what I'm being told. I know what I've heard. I know what information some of you, I see people from all over the world on here, you may not have any information or resources yet. So you are going on your own to find it. And that is amazing. Also, chiropractic care is a common theme that you're going to see. And it's not just because I'm a chiropractor. I wouldn't be here tonight telling you that for no reason. Majority of you, I will never have the opportunity to see or meet or help in person. Right. So what would make me stay here when I could be at home for dinner sharing this information with you? It's because I know it's the truth and I want to help. And then lastly, it's the support. And that's a good first team. That's your doula. That's your midwife. That's the total team working with your providers to help you. So here's what happened uh, with my wife. I'm going to skip down to our last birth. The first two children we had, we were in the military, so they were different experiences. Uh, our first daughter, um, my wife got an epidural, um, you know, went through that process, and it, it was a little traumatic. Our second daughter, we were still in the military. They tried to give her epidural. They missed. Um, she said some very unkind things out loud. Uh, in a rage, which I can understand. Um, and then they wanted her to do another epidural for no reason, by the way, just because it was just a protocol of the hospital. Um, within 20 minutes of them trying to do the second epidural, our daughter was born. And then last, uh, we have what, what we call our all organic baby. So uh, her nickname is Ellie. Um, her real name is Eliana, her full name is Eliana. So Eliana was the only child we've had that I was a doctor. I was a chiropractor already while my wife was pregnant with her. And so we did everything different. We flipped the script. We, we had a doula. We did a water birth. We did as natural as possible. I took care of my wife throughout the entire pregnancy. When it came to game time, as uh, Christian likes to call birth a marathon, so when it came time for the marathon, 30 minutes prior to delivery was the first time I heard my wife make a noise, okay? Prior to that, and by the way, total, we're looking at about three hours and 45 minutes of labor. So prior to that, she's just splashing around in the pool like she's having fun, like she's on vacation. And uh, so then all of a sudden, I just heard a groan, like, oh, and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? She's like, that was just a strong contraction. She went back to splashing around in the pool. And then it was game time. Um, skin to skin, I was able to catch my daughter, no medical intervention, everything natural. Um, we did not, we chose not to vaccinate her. Um, and so she's never been sick. She's never seen a doctor. She's never been on antibiotics. She's a very healthy um, kid, very intelligent, smarter than me. I hate to admit it, but she's always right. And I share that with you because sometimes this stuff seems hokey or weird. And uh, the power that made the body heals the body. Your body is super intelligent and able to function and do things. It just doesn't need interference. And so sometimes we are so quick to medicate because we think that I'm having a headache because my body is low on excedrin, right? There's things that are going on. There's stress that your body is dealing with, and it's having a failure to adapt. And so I just try to keep it simple and keep it real with you. Uh, I wouldn't tell you to do anything that I wouldn't tell my wife to do. And so that's the beauty of it. Now, in our office, we see a lot of pregnant women, I mean, daily. And there is some, some fear around this concept of a breech baby. Well, so far, we are 20 for 22 with breech babies. I've seen 22 women 
that were breached and 20 of them have been uh, were able to get back in position and have a natural healthy vaginal birth that is huge that saves a lot of time potential death all kinds of things that happen when you're in those situations and emergency c-sections and things of that nature so i was uh i'm blessed to be a part of that the two that did not get back into position had the same issue they had a very short cord so the baby physically and structurally could not turn and rotate and i played a video for a birth class that me and christian did a few weeks ago i'm not going to play it now but because it's on my phone but i had a lady come in who had a frame breach i mean baby's legs were up by the ears i mean it was not a good situation it only took me two weeks less than two weeks it was three visits and her baby got back in position and she she's had, had a great delivery and that was about two two weeks ago so I'm telling you that because, again, if that's you, if you're on here and you're afraid or you're worried about that or they told you that, hey, you're kind of early, but the baby is still not in the right position, guess what? There's a solution. Your body is amazing. You and your baby can figure it out. So the thing is, like I told a, a woman earlier today who's stressed, nothing can flow when you're stressed. You ever try having a bowel movement and being stressed and clenching down? Well, when you're stressed and clenching down, guess what? It's not coming out. Okay, until you relax and let it go, it's just not going to happen. I want you to think of your birth process the same way. Matter of fact, when you're delivering, I've been told that it feels a lot like having a bowel movement. So just think, let it flow. Don't stress yourself out, add an extra cortisol that's going to attack your baby because you're stressed. Let it flow. Just know that you were made for this. How do I know you're made for this? Good question, glad you asked. Because you're pregnant, absolutely. So you wouldn't be able to do this. You wouldn't have this situation if you weren't capable. So I believe in you. And I think you need to be around more people that believe in you and can see the good. Uh, if you're ever in Arlington, Texas, and you just want to come and say, hey, I just need to be around somebody who's positive and optimistic, get a hug or adjustment, I'm always here. But seriously, surround yourself with people that are optimistic and think the way you think. Um, so now I'm going to share these last mechanical things about why chiropractic care is essential for childbirth. Now, if you're in a place or in a country, because I saw some of the people here, there may not be chiropractic in your country yet. Um, maybe that'll be a different mission in my life where I'll go and try to make sure everyone has access to a chiropractor. So if you don't have access, I understand, but just listen, do the best you can. So I call it the four Ps, okay? The four Ps, the first one is power. I think most of us understand power. When you look at power, guess what, ladies? You're strong, okay? You're gonna push. That pushing requires power. One of the problems with the epidural is the epidural can numb you so that you can no longer feel how to push. The other thing that can happen is the pelvis. If your pelvis is misaligned, um, then let me show you this model here. It's not going to light up the same for you guys in this video. This is green, which means good. If there's stress on your spine, now it's, it's not good, right? That stress means that nerve is not going to be able to have full communication or full power to whatever it controls. That's why the alignment of your spine, and especially in that lower area of your tailbone, is important because you want to have as much power as possible to push and let your body do its job. Second P is pelvis or uh, passage. So your passage, your pelvis makes up the passage. That's where the baby sits. That's where it you know, resides. And then it just slides out like a slide in Chick-fil-A or something, okay? So you want proper alignment with that car accident, People who uh, may have been cheerleading, uh, soccer, different sports, you know, there's a lot of falls, a lot of different things. Sometimes ladies aren't too good with high heels, they may fall, right? I've seen it all. Uh, as well as having a job where you are sitting most of the time. So one thing I wanna uh, caution you with, if you are uh, seated most of your day, be careful not to sit on one foot or ankle. And I know you guys, ladies do the weirdest things with their legs when they're sitting, right? As a guy, like, it just looks uncomfortable. I don't even know how you are able to do it. Some of you are sitting like that right now. I can already tell when you're trying to fix yourself. So if you sit with your pelvis twisted and your legs twisted, that can actually affect your passage because all that relaxing hormone gets released and now things can just shift too much. And then if that shifts and things are misaligned, then guess what? It makes it a little harder for baby to slide out. Passage is not the same size. Third P is the VIP. It's the passenger. So we want to make sure the passenger is head down, face in the back, should be right in your tailbone, like face, face to face with your tailbone. Um, so the round ligament is important to make sure that the baby stays in proper position. When I said I've helped 20 out of 22 women who were breached, 
Um, I've never physically touched a woman's belly or touched a baby. I don't do that. Uh, I think it's rude to just walk up and touch a pregnant woman's belly anyway. But even as a doctor, I don't ever touch a woman's belly. So nothing that I'm doing to help them has been external. It's all just following the chiropractic principle of the process. Last two is postpartum. This is the one that's unique because this one is not actually during the pregnancy process. But afterwards, making sure that we are able to help eliminate stress in the upper part of the back. So when you're pregnant, a lot of the stress is in the lower part. After you have the baby, you're looking down, you're feeding, you're picking up on these heavy strollers and car seats and all that kind of stuff. So now the stress moves. But if you're in pain, it can decrease the uh, the connection you have with your baby. Because if, if, you're, if you don't want to be in pain, you can resent subconsciously feeding or you're like not looking forward to it. And we don't want that to happen, as well as helping with your hormones being balanced with your adjustment. All those things are amazing. And so if, if I'm able to, uh, Krisha, I wanted to show them a quick testimonial um, from someone that we just saw that had their baby. And, uh, and then I'll wrap it up and let you guys finish. I hope this has been helpful so far. Let's do it. All right. Give me access there. And all right, and you guys have to let me know if you can hear this. Can you see it? Yes. Good. Let's start it. Can you hear it? No. Okay. So let me try taking my AirPods out and see if that makes a difference. My name is Maya Davidson. I have been seeing chiropractic care since I was about 18 weeks pregnant. And honestly, it's the best thing that I have done for myself in my pregnancy. And I think the biggest thing has been preventative care. So I came in at the start of lower back pains and some hip adjustments. And coming weekly to see the team has been a tremendous help from baby flipping at an early age to just me feeling well rested and rejuvenated every week. Um, I can honestly say all those symptoms were gone by the end of my pregnancy. I'm giving birth here soon. And it's just been a truly amazing experience. I have not experienced most pain like, um, you know, SPD or just sciatic leg pain and round ligament because of this preventative care. And the doulas and the whole team that works with women throughout pregnancy has really made me not afraid of childbirth. And chiropractic care has let me know that my body is able to give birth to this child um, with, the, with the assistance of a great team and great care. So if you're hesitating, don't hesitate. This is something that you need to have during your pregnancy and it'll make all the difference. All right. So, um, so the last thing I want to share with you is just say that I, I want to honor you for taking the time. Many of you are in time zones far away. You're waking up early, you're staying up late. Whatever the sacrifice you made to be here this evening, uh, I want to honor you for being here. I want you to honor your body, honor your creator, know that you can do this, you have this, um, if there's anything that I can do to help you, if you are in the continental United States and you would like a chiropractor when Chris sends out information, I will personally help find you. It may take me a while, there's a lot of you, but I'll help you find a chiropractor that's close. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get the link. I'm going to do it easier. I'm going to find the link where you can find one on your own, and I'm going to post it in the chat. But uh, for real, I, I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, that tells me a lot about you. Again, people who are educated, and you know, the old saying is when you know better, you do better. You're going to do better automatically. You just got to believe that you can do this and that you were built for this. Okay. Oh, I see a question. Start chiropractic care as soon as possible. It's easier and better versus if you wait to the last minute, we still can help you. But, um, you know, to get the best result, you want to start earlier. But let me find that link while Chris should get some questions and I'll post it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Did sitting in water to labor at home heighten the chance of getting infection if the mucus plug is out? No, it cannot. So the mucus plug is mucus that the body grows to close off the cervix. And then when your cervix starts to open, the mucus plug will actually come out. But your body is brilliant. Your body's going to grow more. And it's going to protect and fight off anything. 
What's not good is a lot of vaginal checks. So other people's fingers inside the vagina messing around in there, that introduced bacteria up by the cervix. But just sitting in water because you need a little bit of relief or you've had a long day and you just want to relax or maybe you're in labor and you're using water as a comfort measure, go for it. So how often do we need to get adjusted and how many times per week? That is going to be uh, between you and the chiropractor you see and what's going on specifically with uh, your body at that time and whether you've been having chiropractic care before or not. And it's just going to really vary from uh, mom to mom. you have anything else on that, Dr. Godwin? Uh, yeah, so, you know, everybody's in a different place. So we have different categories for prenatal care. I don't have a you know, one size fits all. So someone who's never had pain or injury, they're going to be more of a wellness type. Someone who's already having severe pain, they're going to need, you know, a, a different frequency of care. And then there's other factors. So I like to take each pregnant woman as they are and just give them what they need. I don't want to just recommend a bunch of care for you. But if you, if you come in early, what typically happens is we may see a few times um, and then space them out. But then towards that end, that last time after you're going to be pretty regular about once a week. And if you're having a lot of pain already, you might be twice a week um, just to help out. So I can see if there's any other chiropractic questions. I can try to answer those. Um, TENS unit can be helpful. You just got to be careful not to have it on too high um, and too long. But it helps with spasm and pain. Um, natural birth, definitely. You can have that at the hospital. Uh, looking for chiropractic questions. Pain in the pelvic area, yes. So we adjust the pelvis. That was the pelvis slash passage. That's the second piece. Uh, pubic bone, we take care of all that. Chiropractor absolutely helps with sciatic nerve pain, pregnant right now. Um, so, yeah. You'll thank me you later. Haven't... You'll, you'll... Go ahead. Okay. Can you have a natural birth at a hospital? Absolutely. You can. But that's not what they're used to doing. That's not what they're used to seeing. That's not how they're trained. But you can. I when <laughs> people who take my train for birth workshop, we have a game, right? It's like if you're birthing in a hospital, you want a natural birth. All you have to do is walk through the doors and birth a baby. Right now, the record is six minutes. I walked through the doors, and six minutes later, I had a baby. That's how some choose. You take labor at home as long as you possibly can stand it. And then you walk in. That's how you skip all the interventions of things to do for birth because they don't know how to just sit, you know, stand by, fold their hands and be patient and let the baby come out of your body. They feel like they have to do something simply because it's their training. That's it. But yes, you totally can. I want to answer the question from, I believe that Steve, forgive me if I said that the wrong way. Uh, that is a very good question. And, and Krisha alluded to this earlier. A lot of times when you're in a medical situation, these people, I'm going to be honest with you, they're just trying to go home. They want their convenience, which is why cesareans are so high. I actually, I don't tell a whole lot of people this, but Krisha knows the story. Uh, so I took swimming lessons as an adult like seven years ago. Don't judge me. And um, one of the other adults with me taking a night class and nobody saw it was an OB. And she um, told me her cesarean rate, it was like 60%. And I tried, I tried to not like react and respond, you know, out loud, like, oh, shoot. But it kind of came out. So I asked her why her rate was so high. And she said, look, I don't need to be getting awake, uh, awakened uh, all times so like early in the morning. So as many of these that we can schedule, we're going to schedule them. That is the honest truth. So. When you think about that, that process of birth and monitors and vaginal checks is designed to speed up the process. And the minute they want to put on a fetal monitor, the minute they want to start checking heart rate, they're already setting you up for a cesarean. You just don't realize it until it's already hit you. 
So you get an epidural, all oh, baby's heart rate's going down. Well, you just stress the baby out, right? Now, let me stick a needle in your back. Let's see what goes on with you. How you feel about that, right? So that happens. Your baby's under stress, and they use that as a reason to say we have to get this baby out. The heart rate's too fast. Okay. And so you just got to think through that and be like, hey, and you can always say no, it's your body. I tell people, if you're willing to go to a restaurant and be picky about a cheeseburger or how you want it and what you don't want on it, right? You mean to tell me you can't be more selective about your birth process, but you get one shot. They can remake that burger. You can't redo this delivery, okay? So three must-dos to kickstart labor after 40 plus weeks. Sex, sex, sex. So the prostaglandin in the semen is actually your cervical ripener that goes up to the cervix that causes cervix to respond and jumpstart, jumpstart your labor. What gets you pregnant gets you unpregnant. It's three ejaculations on the cervix equals one medicine that they're going to put up by your cervix or make you take by mouth to jumpstart the process medically for an induction. So other than that, patience. There's just this stigma around 40 weeks that you have to have a baby pressure, which again causes the fear tension cycle and your body clams up and a baby won't come out. So it's patience, it's enjoyable things, things that you love, things that raise the oxytocin levels um, is, and be patient. We have to be patient from natural birth. Can I add to that? Yes. So this is very important. Two things, okay? Um, number one, you, the goal is um, not just sex. And I know you're like, man, I'm a guy. So this is coming from a male perspective and a doctor's perspective, right? And they kind of go against each other. <laughs> but the goal has to be for you to have an orgasm, though. So the sperm does help. But when you have an orgasm, it actually causes dilation of your cervix. So women, listen to me. And if you're men out there listen, listening, have them pay attention. This is what you got to do, all right? Because as a dude, when you say, hey, let's have sex, we're excited. We're all in. But you're going to have to look at him and say, focus. This isn't about you, okay? If you don't tell him that it's not about him, you may miss your opportunity to have an orgasm. And he's just going to be like, my bad. I thought we were good. So if that's where you are, to get that dilation, you got to be in good communication, just like doing the birthing process. It's a, hey, we're going to do this, but this has to be the goal, okay? And whatever that means for you, just make it happen. But he'll enjoy it either way, all right? Good point. That is true. Opens your body up for a baby to come out. <laughs> all right. So how painful is going to be compared to endometriosis and extreme period pain? Also, does have endo and scar tissue make natural labor worse? And if so, tips. So I have not experienced endometriosis, so I don't have reality on what somebody could feel or what that goes through. Um, but I try to get away from using the word pain in labor. It's pain equals labor, pain equals having a baby, pain equals contraction, because we all talk about it like it's pain. But it's actually a natural contraction of the uterus, just like if you were to, you know, contract your bicep. It's the same thing. It's a muscle contraction. And the mental aspect of us all agreeing that it's going to be super painful is makes it more painful because you anticipate it, which makes you fearful, which makes you tight, which makes you have more discomfort. So I use levels of intensity, levels of discomfort, because you have control over that. You can make things a lot more intense and a lot more discomfort in labor, or you can make it less intense, less discomfort by doing simple things in labor. So you have utter control over what level you're going to feel uh, in labor, okay? And that comes with training and my train for birth workshop. Um, that's my opinion on that. Hopefully that helps. I've been told that I have to make a decision about epidural early on, 
early on since they there is a point after which they cannot give me an epidural is that true there is a point of no return like a baby could be coming out of your body yeah you're not going to get an epidural but pressuring you to make an early decision is not cool uh, you can make a decision at any point. You can consent to that epidural and you, you can take your consent away early. You can not consent and you can consent later. Uh, it's it's your choice. It's up to you. And that's just a way of like getting the service sold to you up front. And that way, they're like, well, you did sign here. You know, it's time to do this. But you can totally labor as long as you want or desire to before you make that decision. Uh, sorry, it's hard to see these. What considerations are important when deciding between home birth versus birth center? You need to decide where do you feel comfortable? Where can you be vulnerable? Where do you feel safe? Can you envision, can you envision yourself having your baby in this location? Can you Make the trip if you're going to a birth center and then feel comfortable with having your baby there and then coming back. Home births, you go nowhere. People come to you. Um, so it's really preference. People who want that medium between a hospital and a home birth go for the birth center. And the other, th I think the other misleading thing about home birth is you have to clean it up afterwards. That's not true. When the, your midwife team comes in, they do your, they start your laundry. Uh, they give you tips on how to prepare for it so it's less messy. They clean up any type of blood or bodily fluids that could be on the floor or anywhere. Um, they clean your house before they leave with regards to the birth. Uh, let's see, there's a question. What are your recommendations for people who are group B strep positive? I'm 38 weeks and antibiotics is required for the hospital I am delivering at. A retest won't change that. Um, I'm not sure it could have to do with the state or country you're in. I know in my state, antibiotics are a choice. You can say yes or you can say no. Um, I would refer you to uh, evidencebasedbirth.com has a fantastic um, article on group B strap on things that you can do at home to start preparing your body um, if you are testing positive. The thing about group B strap is you, it's a snapshot in time and you have, when you take that test or you do that test, it tells you what your GBS status is in that moment. The next day it could change. The next two days it could change. It could change a week from there, a month from there. It could change back and forth, but it's only a snapshot in that exact moment. And it's um, unfortunate that they don't, don't re retest and you're just either labeled one way or the other because someone could test negative at that exact instance and then be positive labor, later, right? Because our bodies change all the time. So uh, that article has some really good um, advice that you can do to help prepare your body um, based on group B strep stuff. Can bouncing on exercise ball too early induce early labor? No. Does a colonoscopy affect your ability to dilate? I have no idea. I've never been asked that question and have no information on that. So that would probably be a best question to um, ask your provider. I wouldn't think so. I don't know how that could affect your ability to dilate. Okay, so there's a question on here about heart rate variability um, and then going for a C-section because baby's heart rate's too low or baby's heart rate's too fast. So you want variability in the baby's heart rate, 
right? As you go through labor, but it's the recovery part of what your baby's doing. So your baby's heart rate can go really fast or your baby's heart rate can go really slow, but how is your baby adjusting? Is it coming um, up and down, up and down? So right before you have a baby, there's a lot of pressure on your baby's head and the contractions are really strong. And the oxygen flow to your baby is less because of the compression on the head and those strong uterine contractions. And the baby's heart rate does vary it a lot more right before baby's born. That's actually how we know a baby is about to be born. Um, if the baby's heart rate dips and it hangs and it doesn't come back up and recover, that's the baby saying, hey, I'm not tolerating labor well. Hey, you, you need to come get me. If the baby's heart rate dips and it recovers and comes right back up, then that's that's normal. Okay. So what they're looking for is that that coming back up off of that D cell. And then you have some babies that will be tachycardic, which they'll beat really, really fast and they don't come down. That's usually dehydration. It's not always, but babies get, you know, they get dehydrated in there. There's not enough fluids going in the body. Maybe you've stopped drinking because they told you you can't drink anymore. That affects your baby. Your baby has to have that fluid around the body and if the body's not getting enough fluid then baby will start responding with the higher heart rate level so i wasn't at this part either of these people's births so that could just be some explanations what's going on and in that moment it looks like it was a decision made by a healthcare provider based on what they saw and i that's about all i can tell you as far as information that sometimes the baby's heart rate does go up and down Okay, let me do one more. Okay, so let's talk about, since there's several questions kind of about the same thing, let's talk about when you should go to the hospital and how do you know how much you're dilated? You, dilation is overrated. Period. Plain and simple. There's way too much emphasis on it. When your body's ready to open up and eject a baby, your body will open up and eject a baby. You're going to linger around probably zero to five centimeters for a long time simply because your contractions aren't strong. When you start having that strong uterine contractions close together, lasting for long periods of time, so that intensity is really increasing, then your body's going to change and open up with the baby head pressing down on the cervix to actually leave your body. When do you go to your birthing environment or call your midwife out to your home? When your contractions are like three minutes apart, each one of them is lasting greater than a minute, you actually have some bloody show and mucus stuff coming out of your body. That is a sign that your body is opening up. You will not know how far you're dilated, but if you have the bloody mucus stuff coming out of your body, that's a that shows you your cervix is changing. It's opening up. The capillaries around the cervix are busting and bright red blood is coming out of your body. That's a good thing. That's a good time to go. Not to mention you're going to be hunched over. You will physically not be able to walk straight up with a smile on your face when you go into labor. You will be in a different zone. You'll be hunched over. You can't stand up. They will be intense on top of each other. And you're going to have a lot of pressure in your rectum. That is a baby pressing down the bottom of your pelvis to come out of your body. When you're in that state, that's a great time to head into your birthing location, okay? Before that, it opens you up for more, let's speed birth up, let's speed birth up based on where you are locating it. That comes into that managing of birth again, depending on where you're, you're birthing at, okay? So there's different options as far as that. But if you want a natural birth, one, you need to come train with me for my train for birth workshop, which I'm actually going to drop uh, the link in here now. Okay. 34 plus weeks. If you are, I know several of you are not due till the end of the year. I also have a train for birth pregnancy training program. So it keeps you active 
through your entire pregnancy. Like I have workout plans, five workout plans a week gives you an actual workout, like a PDF workout. And then it shows you the demonstrations. It gives you the videos on what to do. And then when you get to 34 plus weeks, that's where you learn the innate birthing process. How is your body going to naturally labor? What is the process? How is your body going to respond? How do you prepare your body and your mind for that natural birth experience? And then you have an exercise program that's going to prepare your mind and your body for a baby to pass through. And you practice, practice, practice. It is the repetition of the exercises that's going to help get your body prepared 34 plus weeks. And then you go in. You apply that natural birth skill set on your birthing game day, and your baby crosses the finish line. Okay, let me try that again. Thank you for letting me know. You can just message one person. Somehow I, I didn't go to everyone. All right, let's do it to everyone now. Okay, here you go. All right, okay. So you guys, thank you so much for this hour of your time tonight. I hope you feel confidence. I hope you feel better and more powerful in your soon to be uh, decisions you're going to make. Uh, if you feel good, you feel motivated, you're like, yes, I got this. And you come across a day where you're like, you don't feel so hot. Remember this moment on May 10th at the 6.30 to 7.30 power hour that we came together and how motivated and confident you felt. Remember what we talked to you about and chase your birthing goals. We 100% believe in you. You have to believe in yourself. And remember birth is for survival of you and your baby. That's how we keep our species in this planet. And hey, let's try to keep those babies in. Why are we so rushed about getting them out? Keep them in because inevitably they will cross your finish line. Have a good night. Healthy mommy, healthy baby. Labor on.